What's going on, everybody? Let us know that you can hear us. Um, anyways, we are leaving on our road trip today. That's why we're coming to you a little bit earlier than normal. Um, we have a, almost a six hour drive today. Yeah, absolutely. So perfect. Shai says we can hear. That's awesome. Great. Thanks for joining us a little bit earlier. Awesome. Okay. Well, today we're going to be talking about, you know, people have been really trying to cash flow these high interest rates and it's been really difficult. And some people are doing things that we don't think is a good idea in order to try to cash flow. But there are ways that you can cash flow and think about cash flowing in these high interest rates environments. Um, but before we get into the main topic, we are going to go over our Twitter question of the week. If Jerry can pull that up. And Sarah, we're on early because we're leaving today. We're hitting our road trip, our van trip. Down to McCall, Idaho. Um, so Ken, you asked if you could pick any city and state in America to buy property in, where would you pick it? And um, Holmes said the greater Boston area in Massachusetts. So oh, we're not too familiar with that yeah. area. South Carolina's on there too. Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, it's funny, like if you're an East Coaster, you know, you kind of focus there. If you're a West Coaster, you kind of focus there. Exactly. You know. James says Frisco, Texas. Where's that? Where's Frisco at? It's uh, just north of Dallas a little bit. Okay. And then response three is Ryan says Tennessee or Texas. Nashville. Yeah, yeah. Well, Nashville got blown up. It's booming there. So Nashville's, uh, I think Nashville's cooked a little bit right now, but I could be wrong. It's getting pretty unaffordable. Yep. All right, let's quickly just jump into the topic for today. Um, we're going to be talking about high interest rates environments. Um, well, first, before we get into that, do you want to chat about the Fed, how they hiked rates this, this week? Well, we all know the Fed increased rates, so by a quarter point. Um, they're going to do it again, so they say. So I think. I think the one thing that everyone needs to wrap their head around is actually they're not going to cut rates this year. I think that's probably the biggest thing for everyone to recognize is they've been very clear. The first, you know, if, if you just go back to a month ago, they are going to raise rates potentially up to a half a point. They already went a quarter. So, so just to get, if they did cut rates, they would just get back to where they were a month ago, if they cut rates. But everybody thinks that they're gonna continue to raise rates, and that's what um, you know people on the Federal uh, Open Market Committee have said. So, so I think you guys need to all brace yourselves for six and seven percent interest rates and some people are even predicting eight uh, i actually think they're going to keep because the inflation has come down significantly at least the reported inflation so so i think that you just need to wrap your head around wherever the rates are now you have to figure out how to make it work for the next 18 months that's the bottom line because if they continue to go up a little bit obviously financing costs are going to go up and cash flow is going to go down if you have variable debt or construction debt or whatever it might be so just know that whatever it is that you got about an 18 month run here and while the fed continues to control inflation and one of the problems that the fed still, or two two problems the fed still has the first one is shelter costs so as you guys know, because this is a real estate channel, real estate is not crashing. In fact, many of you would say here, my market's doing great, it's going up. Okay, that's inflationary. So your wish is inflationary. So that's not what the Fed wants. 
When rents are going up, that's inflationary. That's not what the Fed wants. So shelter is actually a real problem still as part of that CPI. Uh, the other thing is wage growth. And you guys probably know wages are not going down. <laughs> uh, however, I do think that uh, potentially they could. I think, remember, we talked about this before where the Fed might be trying to grow unemployment, if you can believe that. So uh, we'll see where wages go. But right now, wages are inflationary. So, so keep, your, keep your eye on what's inflationary. Wages and shelter costs right now are inflationary. Very, very cool. Yep. And so for those of you that are um, just tuning in, thanks for joining. We're coming early from the road because we are um, leaving today for McCall, Idaho. So, yeah. and that's a good transition into our topic for today, which is with these high interest rates. And we're gonna, they're gonna be around for a while. They're gonna be around for at least a couple years. Um, you need to know how to cash flow your properties. And a lot of you are saying here that, you know, you're thinking about just selling and maybe buying something else that cash flow is better. Um, but the truth is, is if you're in a low r rate right now, it's very hard to find cash flowing properties, especially now that the rates are at, I think 7.25 would be the best rate you could get on a single family currently. Um, so, I just think that that's probably not a good idea in this current environment unless you found some kind of really good deal. So you need to really understand how to maximize um, the situation. So if you're enjoying the content, please hit, hit the like button. It really helps us out, helps us promote the show, and let's dive in. So I wanted to start with things that people shouldn't do right now, because I think it's very tempting when you're trying to cash flow to um, you know do certain things and you know you're kind of pressured by the bank in different places. Did you disappear on me? I had to go get some coffee. Oh, so anyway, so the first thing that people shouldn't do is interest only loans. So can, uh, Ken, can you touch base on that? Yeah, I think that, yeah, obviously guys, this is one of the risks and this is where a lot of people are uh, in trouble right now is they have these interest only lo loans that are actually adjusting based on what the Fed is doing. So um, if you're, if whatever it is that you have, whether it's a, um, a line of credit or a HELOC or a, you know, maybe you're in a commercial building or it doesn't really matter if it's variable, um, then you are exposed to, of course, whatever the Fed does. And I think what you want at this point, heading into this next, next market, is you want certainty. <laughs> you want certainty of you know, that debt cost. That's the biggest issue. So just be very careful heading into this next environment because we don't know how far the Fed is going to go. Um, and you want, you, what you want is you want a fixed rate loan that cash flows. And then you can always, refinance um, if rates go down. But what right. you're trying to do is hedge if rates go up. Exactly, and then also, you know, with an interest only loan, you aren't able to refinance if your value goes down, and that's for any kind of loan. So if the value of your property happens to be less than you bought it for, you're losing your ability to refinance. So then you're stuck in this adjustable rate loan where if that would happen to you on a 30-year fixed at least you would be in a fixed price so that's precisely what's happening to the syndicators right now is that they in many cases the properties that they bought two years ago three years ago even one year ago actually cash flowed and you know based on whatever the debt costs were at the time and a lot of those syndicators, what they got were floating rate loans. And they thought that they could increase the net operating income or increase the value that way. And of course, refinance into what would be a fixed rate. So that is kind of the model. The model is get your short-term bridge debt or interest only. If, uh, and, and then 
and then fix the property or, or uh, value add the property. And then what you do is you put a fixed rate loan on. That's the model. So what, what, what's happened is the first step has uh, been successful and for most people. In other words, we're seeing a rent growth, we're seeing NOI increase and all that kind of stuff. But now because the debt costs are up, there's no cash out refinance like Daniil said. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if you're trying to sell it, uh, which is certainly another option, now the buyers are taking a look at their cash flow, and so they're not going to offer you the price that you thought because their cash flow is less. So what they're doing is prices are adjusting and cap rates are actually going up for commercial. And this is precisely the problem for most multifamily syndicators, most office buildings, most retail, anybody who has any kind of interest rate, maturity or refinancing or anything that the um, you know, is, is the bank is calling the loan or asking you for more reserves, there are no options. You have to actually fund the difference. Uh, so the cash out refinance is not on the table right now for most people. And that's actually um, because most people had a capital gains strategy. And that's actually the real problem. Most people believed that real estate always goes up. Well, it doesn't. And as you guys can see right now, this is just one of the levers um, that is creating the, the, the values to actually go down, uh, even though the assets are performing probably like many of the business plans that were presented. Yep. And so mistake number two, and this is very similar to what we just touched on, but it's getting that adjustable mortgage. So, you know, not just interest only, but also adjustable. Um, I think people are on a lot of pressure from their real estate agents and their mortgage brokers and their bankers to do adjustable loans because they're such a low interest rate. And the, the theme is rates are going to go down in the next, you know, six or 12 months and we just refinance. So that's the mistake. Uh, I get it. Like if you're a mortgage officer, like we, we know some that are super optimistic and that's fine. But you can't predict that rates are going to go down. And I think a lot of that's kind of where everybody is right now is like, oh, rates are going down, so I'm just going to kind of going to do this adjustable rate. Well, again, these adjustable rates float, and you um, they're unpredictable. So you can't. And there, these loan officers, you know, I, I don't blame them. They're they're just trying to do business. But there's no way that they can predict where rates are headed. And, and you, as the buyer or the principal, you need to just do a fixed rate debt, even though adjustables may or may not be uh, a better option for you today. In other words, a lot of times what happens is a, 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 the more risky a loan is going to require, could require more down. Mm -hmm. And, um, you, you know, don't forget, there's somebody on the other side of that loan. So you have to, um, you have to hedge your risks. And the risks right now are, of course, the Fed. We keep coming back to the same issue. Exactly. And, you know, um, Alex also said you also can't predict that home values are not going to go down. Correct. Which your, which your mortgage broker doesn't talk about. And Labosi said mortgage officers love selling adjusted rates. Yeah. <laughs> Well, like, you got to think about it, guys. Like, you know, I, the real realtors and mortgage officers, they make their money on doing deals. They get commissions, and that's okay. That's how the business is. And, and so when rates are going up, that certainly means for both of those industries that they're making less. And so they're going to do whatever they have to do um, to sell whatever they have to sell. So you just need to know, uh, is that, you know, do you, do you believe it or not? And I personally don't believe that rates are going to go down this year for sure. And uh, if they do go down, they're going to go down a little bit. The first thing they're going to do is pause. <laughs> 
after, you know, they're going to raise rates again, according to them, in August, and then they're going to pause, we'd be very lucky to see a rate reduction in 2023. And it's possible that we see rate reductions in 2024. But I do want to caution you one thing. Remember what happened when rates were low. Inflation. So when rates go down, people start buying things again. And that is precisely what the Fed is concerned about. So I think you should probably just brace for whatever these rates are and for the next 18 months, and you gotta figure it out. And what's gonna happen is the sellers are gonna to have to adjust their expectations. Yeah, and, and also, um, you know, people you know, rely on their mortgage brokers and realtors, but back in 2008, you know, they were saying the same thing, right? Like, it's gonna be fine, you can just sell, you can just, you know, rate, rates weren't really high then, but they were basically saying, this is a great deal, you just buy it, sell it later, do an interest-only loan, no problem. So those aren't the people, salespeople are never the people you wanna get advice from. You just wanna utilize them for what you need them for to sell you something, but the homework and the due diligence is on you. Here's the greatest thing. Just take a look at the comments. You know, there's a number of reporters that, you know, digest the, the Fed minutes and, and what some of the different people uh, on the um, committee are saying. And, you know, there's even what it's called dot plot. That's D-O-T-P-L-O-T. Take a look at dot plot. So dot plot is a indicator for of what each chairperson on the committee is going to do in the next meeting. So they have what's called a dot plot. And you can actually see the what, you know, because obviously when you get a committee of that size, I think there's 18 of them, um, you, you know, you're going to have people that think that rates should be cut, you're going to have people that think rates need to go up, and you're going to have people that think that they should be paused. That's the kind of the whole point of a committee. But just focus there. Just do your research there. And, and this whole time, guys, the last year, year and a half, all the stuff I've been doing on my Friday videos and all that stuff, it, I read the Fed's minutes, I see where their head is, and, and, and we're making all our decisions in our company based on what the Fed is saying. You can make a serious mistake by not doing that little bit of research and listening to just a realtor or a mortgage broker. Uh, and I'm not saying you shouldn't listen to them, but I think you should go in educated as to what is really going on. Yeah, and then I see all these articles, you know, oh, rates will be back down to 5% by the end of the year. And, you know, Sarah brought up a good point. You know, when they do start to lower, it will be very slow. Well, there's no question. Uh, again, there. think about how long it's been since they raised rates. It, it was 11 times all at a quarter half i guess early on it was three quarters but they're not going to lower rates by three quarters of a percent you know the first thing they're going to do is pause and i would guess that they're probably going to keep the pause and watch all the inflation numbers and watch for wage growth even though i saw somebody in there uh, in the comments here said that wages are not growing that hasn't been my experience but it's it's definitely um uh, as an employer, of, uh, we got almost 300 people. Uh, we found that it's pretty competitive out there. And what's really happening is there's a lot of people that, uh, that aren't participating anymore in the workforce. So, um, but it's possible that uh, you're seeing something different. Uh, uh, anyway, so those are the things you gotta watch. And I believe that, um, you know, maybe next year we're going to see some quarter points reductions, but that, what does that even really mean? What is it? It gets rates from seven and a half to seven or eight to seven and a half, or, you know, or maybe you're in the high sixes again, like that really isn't going to move the needle very much. Um, when a lot of these products were at three, four percent, uh, before. So, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be a long time before they get to those numbers again, if they even do. And, and don't forget guys, almost, if you look at the historical averages, that's where we are right now. 
So the people who, you know, just got into real estate in the last 10 years, you, you know, they've been super spoiled with these low rates. And when, when you enter at low rates, that's your expectation. But the truth is, is that's not historical. Well, seven's really not that seven, high. Seven is not that high. The issue is the seller. <laughs> that's the real issue. The price went up on the actual real estate and when that can happen when there's low debt. That's why prices go up. People can afford to pay more because their payments are less. Now rates are up, interest costs are up, and so the big disconnect is actually the price of the real estate itself. It's already corrected and it's continuing to correct on the commercial side. What hasn't happened is we haven't seen it on the residential side. And we have a few comments here. So Andy said that the Fed does not meet in August. Oh, so that, I think they might meet in September. That could be, yeah. Um, Mr. Wright is asking, with the election year coming, the printing press will be coming back on. Do you think that'll have any effect on rates? Well, that's a really good question. The, I think that if that does happen, you know, we can't predict, that's going to be more inflation. So. The, you know, if you take a look at the money supply and the money that went out to people during a pandemic, and I, I, you know, in the form of, in the PPP and the EIDL, and of course the STEMI money and all that stuff, that's actually what's created some of these inflationary issues. So depends on how much and where, you know, so it's hard to know, but, and of course we don't even know if that will happen. It's very probable. <laughs> that um, the administration, doesn't matter if it's red or blue, is gonna do whatever the people need or want uh, prior to the election. And then um, TG had a good question. They're asking, would you still buy single family and just put more of a down payment or would you simply not buy at this time? So it's a great question. So here's my concern. Both Danielle and I are concerned about holding too much cash, even though we need reserves and cash. So you got a, a little bit of a double-edged sword where you want to have dry powder for any kind of potential, you know, call it deleveraging or any issues or, or any, any, um, any, any defaults on real estate. You want to be able to act quickly. On the other side of that, you want to get into something that cash flows because you know that's what that's what we do. So we, we kind of keep a balance. I always like to have cash, but I always don't want to have too much cash because I'd rather have it in a piece of real estate that's hedged with inflation than sitting in a bank account. However, you know right now the the the, the one month uh, T bills are you know, somewhere in the five percent range, and and you can you should be able to get bank interest at you know at least four or more, four and a quarter is what I've been seeing. So those aren't bad returns either by just having cash in the bank. So um, it's going to be interesting. But I think the 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 answer to the question is, is if 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 it cash flows. It's like Daniil just did a deal, what, two months ago? Mm -hmm. And it cash flows. So, you know, she, she bought an affordable home in Scottsdale that cash flows. And um, so, and she got financing and I think your rate was pretty high. Yeah, uh, it was 6.9. 6.9. So, but it cash flows. And so she, she didn't want to sit on cash. So she made the choice there and it, and it cash flows. So, but, and I did have to put 20% down for it to cash flow. So good question. Yeah. And I think too, you have to think of just once rates do go down home prices, probably depending on the state of economy, the economy will go up. So that has something to be, you have to consider. Um, you know, you read that article um, stating that, you know, because of inflation, home prices are going to go up over the next 10 years. Well, I think that's, if you just take a look, I always tell everybody, you know, what was the price of the home you grew up in? <laughs> I think that's an interesting thing to think about because 
you know, inflation does grow pricing, you know, does grow value. And so what we're looking at right now is if you guys are, a lot of these people, if you're just buying a home to live in, I think that's a little bit different than if you're Black Rock or some of these big companies or, you know, on the commercial side where you're actually looking for a cash flow return. You know, I think a lot of people are concerned about whether or not there's going to be capital gains or not, because it's possible that people are just going to sit on these low interest loans. I would, if I like, I, we we own a home in Scottsdale. I think my rate is under three, and you know, I'm just going to, you know, the trade out to the exact same home is significantly more on the mortgage. And I, I built the home and I have uh, not very much debt on it, like six or 700, maybe $800,000 is all on, on this home that I've owned for 15 years. So anyway, uh, it's, a, it's a nominal payment at such a low rate. I'd rather, I'd rather have that um, than um, have it in the bank. At least at the time, you know, um, you know, obviously you can borrow for free when, when inflation's higher than the, the cost of your mortgage, you're in a good position. Now, um, the third, let's get to the third thing that people shouldn't be doing. So you should not be doing short and midterm rentals or furnished rentals. So let's clarify you, if it works as an Airbnb, that's great. We love Airbnb, but don't buy it if it only works as a short and midterm rental and it doesn't cash flow as a long-term rental. Right. Uh, that's the thing. Like we're, we're starting to see not in every area, but Airbnbs are not as hot as they once were. Mm -hmm. And so what ha what's happening and we know a number of people that have are trying to rent these long-term because their Airbnb occupancy, as an example, or VRBO, they're, they're just not cash flowing like they thought. So they're having to go back to a long-term renter and they, they just aren't happening. You know, they're, they don't cash flow, especially now, because if they're on an adjustable, they're in big trouble. And if they're fixed, in many cases, even with Airbnbs, they don't cash flow. I, I have a friend that was up here uh, last week that is trying to buy um, a home that was an Airbnb for 1.5 million in Scottsdale. And the, the opportunity came to him because the person who bought that home is having a problem with the occupancy. And of course, the, you know, the rents don't cover the expenses. So they're, they're, they're coming out of pocket and they can't rent it long term for what they needed. So that's the big problem. You put yourself in a, in a poor situation where there's only one option. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that it's important. Like we said, we love Airbnb. I know we have Jorge on right now and he's the Airbnb uh, master, but just be very cautious. I think, you know, people are so desperate to buy homes right now at these higher prices that they're saying, well, even though I can only get, you know, 3,000 long term, I could get, you know, seven or 8,000 on Airbnb short term. And just the problem with that is, is that the market softens or, you know, you, you don't have it booked as much as you think you're going to have, you can't reverse it into a short or long term rental because it's not going to work. And also then you have to um, try to sell it. And that's what we're seeing a lot right now. Uh, is people trying to sell their Airbnbs that they that aren't working out because for whatever reason in the wrong area, a saturated market, whatever it is, and they're having to cut prices and sell it for less. So just be very cautious about doing that. We like the long term. We like basing the cash flow off the long term rentals. By the way, we're a huge fan of Airbnb. Yeah, we are. You know, Daniel actually has one. Right. <laughs> so this is not a. You know, th we just believe that you do need plan B. Plan B is if Air if something happens with Airbnb, you should be able to rent it long term and can still cash flow. Not as much. So the issue should be it should cash flow long term and it should really cash flow with Airbnb. That's the model. 
Yep. So now let's jump into, we talked about, you know, what not to do in order to cash flow more. So what are some things that people can do that can cash flow more if they're trying to be creative? Because it's all about creative financing right now or getting creative on the rentals. So one thing that people can do, and your sister does this, is rent rooms out individually versus renting the whole house. Yeah, my sister's killed it in this area. She she bought a, um, I'm, I grew up in Everett, Washington, and she, she, she bought a uh, beautiful Victorian home, I think it had six bedrooms, and just absolutely gorgeous house. And what she found was there's a lot of business travelers that didn't want to live in hotels, that were doing contract work or whatever it was, and she found this little niche. And what they want is just their own bedroom to be able to put all their stuff in, they can lock it, um, and share the common areas, you know, if they're there, you know, cook something in the kitchen, and most of them actually don't really even use the kitchen and all that stuff, but they just want a place they can drop their stuff. And so she's, she's gotten a lot more money by, by renting them by the room. And it is a little more complicated, so there are some, some things she had to do with the lease and the shared space and getting a cleaner yeah, like once yeah. every couple of weeks yep all that kind of stuff but it it really jacked her revenue um by doing that so you know as opposed to just renting it let's say that six bedroom house to a family she was able to get you know i think it was like 700 800 dollars a month for this one room um you know times six so she was able to really jack it you know as a as opposed to just trying to get that kind of rent from one person. Absolutely, and I think too, this is a better plan for a larger home versus if you just have like a two bedroom rental. I don't know if this makes sense, but if you start having you know a four or five bedroom rental, the biggest thing that she said is parking, right? There has yep. to be parking for everybody, whether a parking lot or they can park on the street, but you know, not everybody can do that, so that's just something you have to consider. Um, Second way to cash flow a property can be either seller financing or subject to. And our good friend Pace Morby does this. Um, basically, it's assuming these mortgages at a lower rate. Yeah, you're going to want to look into this. Uh, just go over to Pace, uh, yep. M O R B Y, mm -hmm. Pace Morby. Take a look at his channel. He's killing it on this subject, too. He's the best that I know. Uh, in this arena and essentially it's exactly what Daniel said you're, you're stepping in you know the asset right now are these if you have a low interest mortgage that's an asset so you know but there's a lot of scenarios where people uh, will sell their home subject to um, and um, so it is complicated there are some things that you have to consider but uh, it's definitely an option and a strategy Exactly, and I think too um, with um, the subject to you know it's you're looking for somebody with a low rate that has no equity, so that's why they wouldn't just go sell. Right. Uh, Mr. Wright saying, what about security when renting rooms? Are you liable for crimes of one room versus another? So that stuff is in the lease, uh, but I, I can't imagine you would be any more liable than renting to anybody. So there's credit and criminal background checks that are run, and you, you know it's 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 just basically like renting anything. You're just renting it, renting the room with a shared common space. It'd be no different than right. um, you know a dorm or you know a student housing project where you have you know three or four kids, uh, which is, happens in a two three bedroom unit. Um, you know, so the issues usually are not security, they're usually parking. But as a landlord, you can certainly protect yourself by running criminal credit and uh, sex offender checks on all of, of your occupants. That's what we do. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's by the room, but we do that anyway on, on every single uh, resident in our company. If you guys are enjoying the video, make sure to hit the like button. We love that. It really helps us out. The third thing that you should look into doing is buying a multi-unit property. So a lot of the you know, tax burdens and different things, the expenses that are getting higher, multi-unit properties can be easier to cash flow, like a duplex, triplex, you right. know, fourplex. Well, what, what you're doing is you're spreading risk. Mm -hmm. So if you have a six or eight unit and you have one vacancy or two vacancies, you still have income coming in. 
and uh, you know obviously they need to cash flow and all that but you 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 know when you have one you one property and it somebody moves out then now you have no income so the the whole the whole idea here is to, to diversify your your risk by diversifying your income yep and the fourth way to cash flow in these times uh, can be, if you have the time, is to self-manage. So self-managing is going to save you money. So if, the, if you know, that's how I had to do, you know, I self-manage all my properties anyways, but this last one I bought would not have cash flowed if I was not self-managing it because it's a lot tighter than other ones that I have yeah. um, cash flowed before. Yeah, and, and by the way, this is, you know, not for the weary, right? Like self-management is not easy. You, you know, we're talking about there's a fair amount of communication with your tenant. Um, you obviously have all the accounting. You have the, the issue of uh, the move-ins, the move-outs. But, you know, uh, management of, of an asset can be, you know, in the low hundreds to in the thousands. Just depends on the size. And, you know, if you can handle it, uh, it, it is a way to cut an expense. Yeah, absolutely. And the last way, and Jerry, sorry, I switched this on you, is to base your price on the, your, your monthly payment or the interest rate. So I think what people are afraid to do is they're afraid to offer people less than what the home is listed for, significantly less sometimes. But you know, in these times, especially if a home has been sitting for more than 30 days, you know, you might be surprised people might take you up on your offer. Yeah, yeah, again, this is just goes back to, you make your money when you buy, period. You know, and, and that's, that's always going to be the case. So if you buy right and hold, you're gonna be fine, especially if you cash flow. You just, this is just a, um, a period of time, guys. You know, and I've been doing this for 20, almost 30 years now, and you know, Sometimes we have times like this and you just got to have cash and just got to hold through it um, and, and, and not, not jump around with all this noise going on. So yep. I, I do believe prices are going to continue to go down. I do because interest rates do affect pricing. And um, you know we do have a supply issue on the home ownership side, but keep in mind if home prices go up, that's inflationary. If rents go up, that's inflationary. So that's not what the Fed wants. So just keep that in mind as you, you know, you want low rates and high prices. That's not what the Fed wants. So just keep that in mind. So Richie's asking, would it be fair to say that your plan with the new property is to refinance in the future? And Richie, yeah, that is, the plan so basically you know but the good part is since it is cash flowing even though very minimally I can float the next year two three however long it is before rates start to come back down um, without being in any kind of bind but yeah the cash flow on the property it's not great you know what I mean but it's it's enough to just keep it afloat right yep yeah that this is a, these are long-term holds, guys. I, I think what, what happens a lot of times and the, the toughest thing to do is everybody wants to scoop that equity that they have and they want to do it again. And they want the market to go up and they want to scoop all the equity as the market goes up. That's not what's happening now. Equity is going down, especially in commercial, and rates are going up. So it's just the opposite of what you just went through. And just a lot of people are freaking out because they haven't been through it before. That's all. Yep. Um, so we're going to get to our inner circle questions. If you want to become an inner circle member, member um, Steve and Jerry are going to put the link on the screen. Um, and uh, with their inner circle, you get monthly happy hours, lunch with an expert, and obviously you can ask Ken questions and he gets back to all of them, whether it is by um, email or on the show. All right, so our first question comes from John. John is saying, hi Ken, as much as I hate to, I found myself in a position where I may have to sell our fourplex. It cash flows, but I'll spare you the details. My question is about seller financing, which may be a potential scenario that would be helpful. I'm familiar with the basics, but I've never done it. Based on the current market, 
Would it be fair for both sides in regards to the numbers? If the rates are currently around seven, what number percent should I use? And what kind of percentage down payment is fair? Okay, so great question. Uh, a couple things, first of all, um, you have to take a look at your tax situation. So that's also something that you need to, to, to um, weigh in on. So before we do anything ever, the first thing I do is I call Eric and say, we're going to sell this property. What's our tax consequence? So you have to think about that as well. And then um, to the seller itself, if you are going to do seller financing, um, you know, I'm sorry, to the buyer, you obviously have to be below market. So, you know, you're going to want to make it better for that person. If they don't have great credit, which is possible, then you probably can do something a little bit higher. So a lot of it's going to have to do with the credit of the buyer and their ability to be able to, you know, uh, pay that. So if you're doing seller financing, you are now the bank. And um, uh, what I would do is I would do no less than probably 20%. Um, that, that's just me. Some people might be more comfortable with, but I, I want the seller or the buyer to be committed. I want them to be committed financially and also the risk of default if they do default on that first, uh, which is what you're carrying, um, you know, you're going to have to step in again. So there's a lot to this. You need to make sure that you find the, a good attorney that can help you navigate, you know, how to do this and make sure that the whole, the whole issue is on the, the buyer default. And then what condition is the property going to be? should you ever have to foreclose or take it back that's the whole issue you know most people don't have to worry about that with a bank because the bank has a system to be able to to handle that just um you know how do you default how do you what are the notices um what if you have to step back in it's just like repoing a car essentially you know but now you're carrying the note so but i would do 20 percent uh, if they're uh, just to summarize, if, 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 if they don't have great credit, I would I'd charge them a little bit higher. And, and then, uh, you know, make sure you do, make sure you're, you really are thorough and good luck. Yep. And also, like you had said, you know, who's, who's this person renting to? What kind of condition are these renters taking care of your fourplex? Are they destroying it? Is he putting in, you know, criminals and felons and people with poor credit that are going to not be able to pay their lease? So there's, there's some stipulations you might want to put in there as well. So Hector from the Inner Circle is asking, Hi guys, I have the opportunity to sell the only 11 unit complex I own as a single member and I can use the funds to pay off my home. I'd be left with three other partnership ventures that cash flow about 6,000 a month. Do you think it's worth selling a property to pay off my primary residence or am I being too quick to want to sell? I think you're being too quick. Can you go back to the question please? Uh -huh. um, so first of all, um, a lot of it, I can't see it, sorry. Um, first of all, the, the big issue is um, what is the interest rate on your home, mm -hmm. primary? So if you have, let's say, under five, I would not do it. So it's just like me. I, I, guys, I can obviously pay off the, a mortgage on my house, but because it's under three, I just keep it. So you have to take a look at your loan right now is an asset. And that's that, you know, and the person that would be buying that, of course, they're going to have to solve to the current rate. So you're going to get less on your 11 unit if they have to go out and get new financing. So that's actually what's happening with these multi units is they're bring, being repriced. So I would venture to guess that that 11 unit complex is probably 30% less in value today than it was a year, year and a half ago, only because of the debt. So, you know, I, I would just hold if I were you. And, um, you know, that's of course, if you have under 5% on your primary, and I don't even know what you have with your um, 11 unit on a fixed rate. Plus also the tax 
burden of yeah. that is going to be high. Tax burden as well. So I'd be careful with that one. Good question though. Yeah, absolutely. Our next question comes from Chad. He's asking, my portfolio is structured with my property to, hold, to be held in LLCs. Those LLCs that own the property are then held by the parent LLC. When collecting rent from my property manager, who should be paid? The LLC that owns the property or the parent LLC? The LLC that owns the property. So yep. yeah, you always pay the, the one that owns the property. So you can have multiple structures inside. We, we do this all the time, but you know, you want to make sure that whatever uh, the check is written to the, the property owner, um, not the parent, because the parent, of course, probably owns and is in multiple partnerships and that's not what you want. Yep, absolutely. You want them all separate. Keep everything yep. separate. Good question. Florian is asking, she's a new, he or she is a new limited partner in a multifamily syndication in Phoenix with a variable rate mortgage. They're having trouble meeting the capital call. If they default on the property and it goes back to the bank, what happens to my initial investment? So, um, that's a great question. So here's the thing. If it defaults and the bank takes it over, then they're, you, they're going to size up what that asset is worth. That's the biggest issue. So we can't tell what's going on with your investment until we actually know what the value of the property is going to be when it actually goes back to the bank using your scenario, if you, which I think you said if we default the property goes back to the bank. So once the bank owns it, they're going to do a valuation and then they have to take a look at the price of that uh, property at the time based on the loan and of course anything else that they might have so more than likely the 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 very first thing that goes away is the lp equity so if i'm guessing but i don't know uh, you you could be in a scenario where the 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 value is high yet they just can't make the payments and then of course you, you know uh you still have equity in there because the bank is they're going to always solve to the, the the loan that's in default that's the first piece and they're not going to take the profits above that so those will be allocated based on whatever's in your operating agreement so basically if the property's worth you know three and the loans at two and the bank sells it for three then that million then, yep. dollars will be split depending on your percentages to all the LPs. Not necessarily. It's going to okay. be depending on the operating agreement. So, Got it. Yeah. So it's possible. So what we're seeing now is there, there are sometimes people are getting hard money loans to try to keep these properties. So that might be in front of the LP money. There's, you know, but the, what's well, to your point, the first thing that will happen is the bank will pay off that 2 million. Mm -hmm. Then whatever's recorded, or, or um, um, amended inside of the operating agreement will be paid next. Um, and then after that typically is your LP equity. So you just gotta, there's a waterfall on every single asset and it should be clear inside of the operating agreement. So you could ask your general partner about the waterfall. Um, and of course the first thing in the waterfall is the debt. And the second thing could be more debt or it could be some kind of a loan. And then after that is typically the, um, the equity. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, those are, you know, those are real situations and people are finding themselves in right now. And that's why, you know, getting that fixed rate debt is so important currently. Yeah. Well, and just having cash to be able to, you know, pay the loan. And um, that, that's, that's it, even if it is variable, you know, like, like on a construction deal, you have to have that cash. Yep. Um, our next question comes from Peter from the Inner Circle. He said, hi, Ken. My brother and I purchased a 12-unit mixed-use building, 11 apartments and one convenience store in August 2021. We have a 3.35 year arm, so adjustable rate mortgage, that is coming due in August of 2026. Um, by August 2026, we'll be profiting over 22,000 monthly. Our goal is to do a cash out refinance and continue investing. 
Aside from increasing the NOI, what else should we be doing to best position ourselves by August 2026? Oh, great question. Uh, really good question. First of all, congratulations. That sounds like a heck of a great asset to be able to do 22 grand monthly. Um, the, the one thing that when you get into the, the, the maturity date, uh, what was the date? August of 2026. If I were you, I, you know, this is what we would do. So when you're going to, um, a lender to do a, to a refinance or even potentially a sale, hopefully you're not selling this cause it sounds like a heck of an asset. Make sure that um, you get all your leases current at the highest prices possible. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to try to, um, to, to, to get these leases uh, renegotiated if you can, uh, even on the convenience store, um, get them to market rents by the first quarter of 2026. And then you really, really want to dial in on your expenses. And you probably want to hold off on any capital costs or renovation costs or anything that's in cash flow in 2026 because what you want is you want to show the very best NOI that you can. Um, and you're probably going to start the refinance process in, at least in May or June would be my guess because it can take months to get appraisals and all that kind of stuff. So the 2026 numbers need to be super clean um, and clean meaning that the rents need to be maximized and the expenses need to be minimized because the bank is going to be using or the lender or whoever it is they're going to be using the 2026 uh, and uh, trailing numbers that's that's the most important thing yep absolutely that's a really good question yeah um running with altitude from youtube is asking do you think the phoenix market will see bigger price corrections because it's a bubble market than let's say maybe the midwest or somewhere that didn't go up quite as much so I think a lot of this is going to have to do or is going to do with migration. So the one thing that's kind of holding some of these markets higher are people moving there. So it's just simple math. You, you have a lot of people moving to a location and not that much supply. So I think that that's probably the bigger question is, you know, is yeah, at some point, pricing um, can affect migration. And so, you know, right now, Phoenix is pretty reasonable, in my opinion, still. So I would imagine that they're gonna have slow, steady growth. And, um, but it's possible, you know, the, obviously the new rates, uh, people go there, they're, they're actually being forced to rent, probably, uh, in a lot of cases. But um, you, you imagine, you think about, because by the way, we live there. So, you know, when people come from, gosh, you know, New York or Washington or California, they look at Phoenix as a bargain. And, you know, you imagine, so the perspective of from there, from their perspective, where they're maybe uh, in a $2 million home and they buy a million dollar home in Phoenix, it's comparable. You know, they're, they, they see it as a bargain still. So that's, I think, the, the bigger issue, um, obviously r r interest rates are going to be um, a problem, uh, I, st I still believe, uh, going forward. But if, if it's a primary residence and not a cash flowing deal, uh, I, I think that Phoenix is still going to continue to grow. Yep. Well, thank you all for joining us today. We've decided we're going to be making vlogs from the road, so be sure to check those yep. out. This was uh, George Gammon's idea. Yeah. He's like, Kenny, you got to vlog, so we're going to. Ken we're, and I are trapped in a van together. We're going to we're going to vlog. Uh, make sure you follow us on social. It should be fun. Uh, you know, this morning, by the way, I said, "Oh, we done packing the van." She's like, "Well, I've got my blender. I've got my juicer." I've got my kettle. cooler. What? Tea kettle. Tea, I got my tea kettle. I've got my food. So we're still packing the van. <laughs> <laughs> this is me being a minimalist. <laughs> oh yeah, I said I said you're gonna struggle being a minimalist, aren't you? Uh, so anyway. All right. Well, should we'll, be fun. We'll see you guys next week. See you guys. Bye.